talking about what happens when I pray. The hall was dark with the exception of one lighted candle near the casket of Louis the Fourteenth. The candle was supposed to be a symbol of the ruler's splendor. But at the appropriate time the court preacher reached out from the pulpit and snuffed out the candle and shouted out to all the dignitaries present, God only is great. And then he quoted from Psalms 145 verse 3, Great is the Lord and greatly be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. That was Psalms 145 verse 3. Then he also quoted Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Ephesians 3, verse 20. This means that when we pray, we are praying to someone who can do anything that we ask. No matter what it is, he can do anything. And then some, even more than we can even think to be possible. The Lord can do it. When we pray, the power of God Almighty is applied to our needs. The Lord has a tremendous amount of power. When we stop and think about it. The power that created the universe is the power that responds to our prayers. According to Genesis 1.1, Psalms 33 verses 6 through 9, and Job 37 verse 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How much power did that take? More than we could even imagine. Psalms 33 verses 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth, he spoke them into existence. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up deep in the storehouse. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and it was done, and he commanded, and it stood fast. By the breath of his mouth, he created all of these billions of stars and galaxies and moons and planets, all the hosts of heaven. And he lays up the deep in storehouses. We have a storehouse of food in the oceans for our taking. His thunderous voice still commands us today. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. Job 37 verse 5. Let's consider the words of James Dobson to underscore this thought. I am awestruck by the unbelievable dimensions of God's creation. How does one grasp the meaning of the visible universe that's at least 30 billion light years across? At least 30 billion. How does one grasp the meaning of such a thing? And it's composed of a hundred billion galaxies. 
we can only see a few around us. Each containing hundreds of billions of stars. This is a scientist taking a look at what God does when God doesn't make sense. That's the name of his book. It is breathtaking to consider what exists in the silence of the sky and space. One of the objects that's relatively near to us is called Epsilon. It's a star. It is actually physically larger than the entire orbit of the planet Pluto in our solar system. That's how large that rock, Epsilon, is. As big as the, the orbit of Pluto around our universe, basically. If it were hollow, it would hold more than 2.3 billion of our sun. If a scientist is that amazed, I know that I'm truly more amazed than he is because he has more equipment to look at and things deeper that he can see. You see, the power that created the earth is the power that responds to our prayer. What a tremendous force prayer has because of the power behind it, the power of the Lord. In six days, God did three things to our unique planet. According to Exodus 20, verse 11, For in the sixth day the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, verse 11. You see, He literally created it. He spoke it into being. Second, he made it. He formed it into the form in which he wanted it to be. And then he formed it literally, like a potter does with a potter wheel, fashioning it so that mankind could live in it while he's here on this earth. But then again, this is the God to whom we pray and we entrust our entire care to this Lord. The one that did all of these things in creating and making and forming this garden that we live on here in this billions of galaxies and planets and stars. The power that created man and woman is also the power that responds to our prayers. In the words of King David in Psalms 139 verse 13, You formed my inward parts and you covered me in my mother's womb. What a tremendous job the Lord did. Another way of translating these words is quite revealing. It says, I am respectfully and distinctively made. Each and every one of us is a distinct individual. And we are respected by each other as well as by the Lord. First, God respectfully crafted us into a marvelous compilation called DNA. Scientists think that uh, a cell, a single cell of a human body, may have as much as 100,000 different genes in it. Each cell, 100,000 genes, different genes, and they're all linked in a strand. And we're made up of these DNA strands. They're all intertwined within each and every single cell that we have. These DNA genes of the human body are so tightly coiled in each cell that if all the strands of DNA 
in the average human body were unwound and joined together, scientists say the string would be long enough to reach from the earth to the sun more than 400 times. I don't know where my power went. Did it go away on the screens? Hmm. It appears that the power got unplugged here, or was never plugged in. So let's see if we can bring it back up. That'll look good on our tape, won't it? Can you imagine what we're talking about? 400 times this strand of DNA goes up to the sun and back for each and every particular individual. Scientists think that there are about a hundred trillion cells in the average human body. A hundred trillion cells. And each functions with its own communication system its own repair system, its own nutrition system, its own waste system. Each one is like a little city, isn't it? Capable of doing everything it needs to take care of itself. So efficient are these vital functions of the cell of a normal living human being that some scientists feel that any one of them is better organized than the entire, any city in the world. You know, we have some cities that function and we have some cities that are dysfunctional. But every cell in your body functions better than any city on the face of the earth. Secondly, God distinctively set us apart from the rest of the creation by making us in his own image. According to Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And at the end of 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. What a powerful individual. But you know, he's spirit. He's spirit according to John 4 verse 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. He made us eternal spirits as well because we are like Him, eternal souls. Hebrews 12, verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more be readily in subjection to the Father of spirits? And live? None of us wants that eternal death. But we do want that eternal life. And he fused us into our physical bodies as spirits and souls. Therefore we do not lose heart even though the outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions which are but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Our eternal lives are at stake here. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, we can see our eternal bodies, I mean our temporary bodies here right now. But none of us can see our eternal spirits which are within us. God fused that into our bodies. That's the kind of power that he has. And you know when our spirit leaves our body, 
That's when death occurs. For the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. James 2, verse 26. You know, when we pray to God, it sets his providence in motion. In the Bible times, God involved himself with man miraculously, overriding the laws of nature. That's what it means by being miraculous. It's overriding the laws of nature. In providence, he works within the laws of nature to accomplish the goals that he so desires. <coughs> we know for a fact that he defied the laws of physics in Exodus 15, verse 8. <clears throat> he defied the laws of procreation in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 35. And gravity in John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. As for the laws of physics, in Exodus 15, verse 8, and with a blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together and the flood stood upright like a heap and the depth congealed in the hearts of the sea. That's not a natural thing, is it? That's a supernatural thing that God did. That's for procreation. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. That's not a natural thing for a woman to have a child without knowing a man. The Lord overcame the natural laws of procreation in order to perform this immaculate conception. As for gravity, so when they rowed the boat, boat about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And drawing near to the boat, they were afraid, and he said to them, Do not be afraid, it is I. Would you walk on the water like that without sinking? Jesus did. But yet he was a man like you and me at this point in his life. So the Lord defied gravity in order to walk on water. Otherwise he would have sank just like you and I do. You know, God has involved himself with man providentially. He still does today. By using the laws of nature. Take a look at James, 8, uh, James 5, verses 16 through 18. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The power of the Lord is able to heal you if you ask providentially. He doesn't do it by miracles, but he uses his power providentially to heal each and every one of us when we pray for it. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's power in prayer. And God will answer providentially our prayers. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Three and a half years. Providentially, God used nature so that it did not rain. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. His providence was back at work again, wasn't it? 
Note that Elijah prayed earnestly. And God powerfully employed the laws of nature in response to his prayer. Equally so, our effective, fervent prayers avail much. You know, sometimes people just whisper little prayers and they don't really mean them. They need to be effective and fervent to the Lord. Not just a, oh, thank you, sir, and bye. Oh, and by the way, I want this and that. That's not an effective, fervent prayer. Not even site-specific. Literally, our prayers have great force because God providentially responds to them. It's not us, it's Him. He employs the laws of nature to accomplish His benevolent will on our behalf. And guess what? When He responds providentially, nothing less than the best will result. Nothing less than the best. When we pray without exception, God will give us only what is good and perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. For the, equation, for the occasion of the request that we're making. According to James 1 verse 17 and Matthew 7 verses 7 through 11. Every good and perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation. And no shadow of turning. God doesn't vary. If he says he'll give you the best, he will give you the best and nothing less. God desires that we pray to him and that we seek the things that we desire. He tells us in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one who asks receives, and he who seeks find, and he to him who knocks it will be opened. There's no more powerful words than that for prayer. He goes on to say, Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to you who ask him. You see the power of the Lord and the providence and the way he works in your lives. You know, if something is not for the best and we ask for it, it will not happen. The Lord only gives the best. If something is for the best and we do not ask for it, it might not happen at all. If something is for the best and we ask for it, we better get ready for it to happen because it's going to happen. The Lord says it will. And I believe His Word is true. There are three broad ways that God answers prayers. Times He says yes. Sometimes He says no. And sometimes He says, I'll give you something else instead. The examples that we have listed there. When he said yes, Hannah and I, Hannah prayed for a child, and he said yes. When Hezekiah prayed for his life to be extended, he said yes. He said yes to David when he prayed for forgiveness. We have a liar and a murderer and an adulterer asking for forgiveness, and the Lord said yes to David. You know, when the church prayed for Peter to be released from prison, he opened the gates wide. Therefore, when we ask for what is best, we can be assured that we're going to receive it. When God says no, there were ten, plenty of times when he says no. Moses, when he prayed for forgiveness for his impenitent brethren, the Lord said, no, he requires repentance. 
He told Abraham, no, you can't do it. When David prayed for the life of his son, he told him, no, your son has to die. When Jesus prayed for release from Calvary, God said no. It's interesting that some of the greatest men in the Bible were given negative responses to their prayers. Of equal interest, God said yes to Hezekiah when he asked for his life to be extended. But he said no when Jesus asked for his life. Why? Is Hezekiah better than Jesus? No, he's not. Jesus died for us. And that was the Lord's plan. So we had to tell him no. You know, there are times that God says, well, I'll give you something else when you pray. For example, when David appeared and he asked for permission to build God's temple, God told him, no, but I will give you a perpetual kingdom that will last forever. He gave him something better, but not what he wanted at that time. And Paul, again, he asked God to remove the thorn from his side. God said, no, but I'll give you the grace to endure it for the rest of your life. It's there for a reason. I know not if the blessing sought will come in the way I thought. But I'll leave my prayer with him alone whose will is wiser than my own. And assured that he will grant my request or send some answer far more blessed. Those are the three ways in which God answers our prayer. My question is, are your prayers being answered do you do what the Lord asks you to do? You know, we as Christians know the fiery trials that may rage in our lives and burn out of control. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials in which try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, 1 Peter 4, verse 12. They may even leave us walking through the ashes of the used-to-be's or might have been in our lives as things burn up around us. The flames can never touch the peace that comes when we turn our problems over to God. 1 Peter 5, verse 7, and Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Be anxious in nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Will the fiery trials of life lead to the fiery eternal life for you? That's a good question. Is your soul right with God? You know, we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. Would you be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before men? Give your life in that belief? All sin is against God. And a righteous man will beg for forgiveness. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. You know, Peter may have the answer to some of your questions on salvation. He said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. The invitation is yours. 
while we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?